Thanks for joining us today, guys. Today we are joined by Beata or Beyonce, uh, whichever <laughs> one she wants to go by on a, uh, any given day. But uh, to kick us off, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience and uh, kind of give a little background about yourself and uh, your journey. Thank you so much, Liam. So my name is Beata Chalette. I'm the growth architect and I help visionaries and leaders to make their impact in their lives or in their business by helping them with uh, devising blueprints and strategies to do that. And my story is I'm a German immigrant. I've been in the United States for a very long time now. I was a single mom. And at one point, I was $135,000 in debt and had a decade of bad luck. All the stuff that you hear about that happens to other people happened actually to me. And then I had to figure out how to crack the code and get out on top. Excellent. And how did you do that? Like, what, what was that process like, right? So obviously, we talk a lot about money on, on this podcast and kind of how people invest it. As you were going through that decade and that trying time, right? Like, what was that like for you? It sucked. So, uh, you know, to to sum it up, it's like, you know, when we set out to be business owners, Liam, and so we do everything right, right? Or so we think, you know, we we work hard, we we pour every penny back into the business, we 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 check out how can we go on these trade shows, how can we afford to fly to places to meet clients and make everything happen. And irrespective of what I did of a literally a decade, you know, there was riots, fires, floods, earthquakes, September 11th, a tsunami. And, you know, no matter what I did, there was always at every corner, it felt like there was somebody with a frying pan and just whacked me over the head. And then I fell right back to where, where I had started. And what it is, is I think that we often as business owners are, attached to how we want our journey to go because the messy middle is what most people don't really like to talk about. They talk about where they started and they talk about, and then I turned my luck around and boom, voila, I was a millionaire. But they do not talk about how they got from figuring out this messy middle to actually turning this around. And for me, it was a lot about having to figure out how to not get caught up in the minutia, in the detail of what was happening to me, because I had to learn how to not obsess over how I was going to be paying my bills, because you as a finance man, you will probably love this financial strategy I had. And it was borrow money to pay interest on borrowed money. I mean, that is a sure way to success. <laughs> you guys can't see Liam's face, but you can only imagine. I think he's like internally rolling his eyes or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, it, clearly this was a game to nowhere. And I taught myself how to not worry about money except twice a month when I had to pay my bills. And then when I paid my bills, I focused on what I had control over. And that was the business because I, that was the only way for me to turn it. And in all of this, I fly to Germany. I go uh, to drum up some business. My father has a stroke. My father didn't have a stroke. My father had pancreatic cancer and he died a couple of weeks later, six weeks later. And then we are in the funeral. And remember, I'm like $135,000 in debt. I mean, things are not good. And I don't even know how I'm going to pay for the funeral. And my phone rings. And now my office called me and says, we've just been served a notice. We are now losing the house. And it was the new guy that bought the property that wanted me out. And he waited until I was in Germany. I mean, it was, it was, it was just, it was just horrible. So I come back, I have to figure out how am I going to move? How am I going to, how am I going to get it, get through all of this? But I had written in my desperation, a letter to the president of the United States, true story. And I wrote a letter to the president of the United States, George W. Bush then, because I was so incredibly desperate and my former mother-in-law just wouldn't stop talking about it. And that letter was sent to the small business administration in Los Angeles. And I got to meet the deputy chief director who said to me, well, we like your business plan and it's all cute, but really we, anybody's only interested in the numbers. We don't care about your marketing ideas or your branding or your differentiation factor. We wanna know how you're gonna pay the loan back. 
And so within only three months, they helped me to find a bank that was refinancing my debt in a 10 year fixed, uh, fixed term that freed up my line of credit. And that brought me to break even. So the difference between bankruptcy and break even was three months. And from there on, 18 months later, we are the world leader in our category. And uh, it sounds like yeah. the, big, the biggest piece of that three months was likely not paying interest on interest anymore and getting to a more manageable payment, it seems. Um, so you could start reinvesting or doing other things with the capital, I would imagine. Yes. Yeah, so a lot of that was about that, because obviously, when you get these checks in the mail from your credit card company at what is it like 19%? Um, and they said, you need an extra $5,000. I said, yes, a lot. And so when you're 19 and 15%, you know, then it's the game that I played of when they said, you know, take $25,000 on this credit card and don't pay interest for six months, then I would do that. So I didn't have to pay interest. So I was constantly moving money from one place to the other to avoid paying these 20%. But I paid a lot of interest. So yes, you're absolutely right. So once it wasn't one payment, I didn't have to play the game of what was I gonna do? I was, I was paying, I think like $1,200 a month compared to what, 16 different payments in all kinds of denominations to one place and that that just gave me enough room on the line of credit to to do the things I needed to do to make it until we were getting to break even. Absolutely correct. So talk to me a little bit about uh, obviously a lot of different ideas that went in, right? Um, how did you get to the one that was successful and made you a market leader, right? And is there anything as you look back? that you would do differently or set up your framework that you would think you could get to that success faster? You know, I wished I could say that and answer that with a resounding yes. I think what I've learned in, in my career and what I'm doing today is no different, is that you really only have control over two things in business. One is where you start, where you are at right now, because you're here, because this is the result of every decision you make. And whether that's good or bad, it just is. You're here because of what you do, how you do it, and what you believe in. The second piece is you have influence over where you want to go. The piece on how you're going to get there is not up to you. That's up to a higher power, God, universe, spirit. Because when you are, you know, we, we start with a set of experiences and mindset and our program of what we know, mainly what our parents taught us, what school taught us, what environment teaches us, and what the whole educational system is set out to achieve. So we are entrepreneurs and we learned that none of this really applies to what we're doing. It's about risk-taking, it's about courage, it's about understanding the difference between protecting and growing and um, what a completely different mindset that is that you need to step into that. And then you have to unlearn everything that you know, because if you don't, you are repeating your parents' patterns. And so your parents are middle class, and not that there's anything wrong with that, and their parents were middle class, chances that you are going to be middle class are pretty high, unless you make that shift in your mind to think and act differently. But that means that everything you believed in is wrong. And then your dad's wrong and your mom's wrong and your grandparents are wrong because what do they all say? Get a good job, make sure you have a salary, make sure you negotiate enough vacation and buy the house with a white picket fence. Um, don't get too fancy on the car, just make sure it's a reliable car and then you die. And when you don't want that, you have to overcome all the, the, this program and the pieces. So once I understood that I didn't want to be my mother and I didn't want to be like my brother and I didn't want to be like my sister and I didn't want to struggle, I looked at what do I need to do to change that. And when I looked at what people do that are successful, 
it literally is the difference between the mindset of protecting what I have because somebody could take it away from me to how do I grow what I have to that next level? And when you, you know, when you do a hand gesture and you think about what the protection hand gesture feels, it like goes down, right? It keeps it down. And when you say growing, how the gesture, the hand gesture goes up. And so I give you an example that's very specific to money. So when COVID hit and, you know, I sold my business for millions of dollars to Bill Gates. So my portfolio for me is a good size for other, for, for Mark Cuban, probably not so much, but for me, <laughs> for me, it's a good size portfolio enough that I would not have to work again. Would I choose to do that? But there's the day where I look into the account and it is down by a significant six figure number, significant. And I call these moments in life, the oh shit moments, Leah, where you go, oh shit, what do I do? And what I want to do is I want to hover over it and protect what I have. And then I realized that that's the wrong attitude that I have to think about now that this has happened, what do I need to do to grow what I have again? And the minute I changed that mindset, it was about four months into it, my portfolio started to grow and grow and grow beyond what it was before. So why is that? I think it is because success is determined by your ability to recognize the kind of success you can really have. And it is the same thing with using and growing money. So you talked about you first came, you're in debt, 135,000, right? And then obviously on the other side of the spectrum, you have sold your business to Bill Gates for a lot of money, right? And the messy middle, right? Uh, obviously there's a decade or more of significant challenge. Uh, and then there was kind of a, a corner that was turned. Once you started experiencing profitability, right? More cash flow. Um, what was your mindset and kind of how did you determine where to put that cash, right? Because now you're not having to worry about two payments a month, right? You know, you've got those covered or you've paid them off, right? I don't know what you've done, but uh, as you started to kind of look forward and having this money, what did you start to do at that point? So what you do is, and which is what I'm doing again right now, is you need to see how are you when you are at that next level, right? Because people always think that they get to the next level by doing what they're doing today. So if I only work harder, then I make a little bit more money. So then, then I can afford to hire someone or to buy this and then X is going to happen. That's not the way it works. The way it works, you make a decision that you are going to the next level. You take the action before you have the money because then the money needs to show up. And that's an energetic principle of, of prosperity. And a lot of people get that wrong. I know a lot of people, Liam, I'm sure as you do too, that got their, uh, their loans, their uh, low interest loans from the SBA. And then all they did is put the loan in the bank in case something happened. That's not what you do with cheap money. What you do with cheap money you put it to use to grow your business. And the way you do it, you need to immediately look for, which is what I did then and what I'm doing now with the money I got. How do I create leads? How do I set up my, my um, sales process? What different uh, categories of outreach programs am I going to run which ones are going to be successful? Where are my clients? So we decided the minute we got the money that we were going to do a, a LinkedIn strategy. So we hired somebody to do that and paid them because I have no time to do everything myself. Now, you know, business is much, much better again, thank God. Now we are uh, hired just somebody to do our Instagram campaign. Uh, we are redoing our YouTube strategy because that completely, um, completely imploded 
for reasons that we don't have any control over. That was an artificial intelligence issue that sent us all angry white men who hate independent women like me and then finally found one they could vent on uh, why they wouldn't be seeing their children and their careers. I mean, it was ugly, um, including death threats. And once you're in that category, there's very little you can do other than to just wait it out until the interest wanes and then you have to come in with a different strategy. So we had to let that strategy go and now we're working on another one. So to, to, to sum it up, the way to be successful in business is that you got to be very clear if you have a lifestyle business or if you want to have a business that you eventually want to sell. There's no business in the world that I want to run as a lifestyle business. The only businesses I want to build are businesses that I can sell. Why, 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 why bother otherwise? So every business that I build is set up for acquisition. So it takes me a little bit longer sometimes to be okay with the revenue because if it's not enough revenue, then I'm going to have to change it. So I, was, I started out as a photographer, consultant, but photographers don't really spend money because they're more, they, they're more in the creative arts. And I went for creative entrepreneurs. That would have been a lot of microtransactions, but I prefer macro transactions. So I had to change that. Then I went to in the consulting route, working with um, business owners at a certain level that really want to scale up as a strategy, strategist that want to have strategies to grow, build and scale their business. That brought me to some corporate work because um, it's the same idea on whether you scale up a team or you scale up a business, it's the same thing. And now it's all about systematizing it in such a way that were somebody to say, like it's already happened to me once before, we want the brand of the growth architect or we want to buy the brand of the women's code, what do we get? And how would we go about it that I can hand them the book? And that's what happened the last time I handed them a book with all the processes and procedures. And that was that. And that's how I set up businesses. So I'm not interested necessarily because I have the income from my investments. What on whether I make that $5,000 extra right now or not, I'd rather put that back in the business if I can sell it again for a couple of million dollars. It's much more interesting to me. What's the, so it sounds like you did that, you were successful. You have the ability to walk away if you want. What drove you back to do it again? There was a moment where I was at a conference, Liam, and there was a mastermind. And there's like a hundred people in this room and there's two women. One is married to one of the guys, and then there's me. And then they were talking about, you know, ideas like we do in a mastermind. And then I had this idea about the women's code, because ultimately I want to change how leadership is being looked at and add a definition of a female part of leadership to the existing definition of what leadership is, which is mostly male. So that we, as we're looking forward into the future of leadership and how Generation Z and the millennials are operating, the future leader needs to be a lot more balanced and a lot more fluid to move from male to female because these old structures don't work. And so I, I talked about that. And the minute I mentioned it, it was like you heard a pin drop in the room. And I said, and the reason I want to do that is because I feel that this being out of balance is really not good for the world and for people in general. And people hate what they do. And I have an idea that I think I can bring, bring, bring to the market. And then afterward, you know, when I was like, well, but I don't know, it's going to be so much work. Do I really want to get back into it? I mean, you're changing the world. I mean, who am I? You know, like the typical things we go through. And then my friend Christian Bard came and he said to me, have you ever thought about that God helped you to be so successful in your first transaction so you could do this? And it was like, I was hit by this wave of, oh shit, here we go again, right? Now, now that I know what do I do? And that's how I feel about what I do. I'm not driven by money. 
I am driven by impact, which is why what I do is measured in impact, not by money. And that's why I work with people who are activated and who want to make a bigger impact. Because if you do that, the money follows automatically. I don't need to focus on that. I don't need a Lamborghini. I already have a nice house. That's not what success to me is. What success to me is, Liam, is when I go into Clubhouse and somebody uh, comes on stage and says, you said something in an interview five years ago that changed my life. And you are the reason why I am where I am today. That is powerful. When someone says, I had a nervous breakdown. I didn't know what I was going to do. I hated my job. The women at work were terrible. I found you in the women's code. And um, I took one of your programs. You probably don't even remember. But that's why I am now today a coach for women in executive leadership positions, because I want to help them not to experience what I experienced. That, that's why I do it. Does that mean that your current business is a lifestyle business then? Or are you still growing to scale to sell? No, I'm growing to scale to sell. It's just the motivation is different. Okay. So the motivation, so if I, what's the difference if I would say, I want to impact 10,000 people. If I want to impact 10,000 people, I'm going to be making money. It's not possible otherwise. I'm certainly not a charity. And I certainly, you know, I, I, I ask for real fees, but it's not my motivation. I mean, I love it. And it, green looks great in my bank account. <laughs> um, you talked a little bit about this dichotomy of women leadership, right? And it changing and being more fluid. Um, you know, what feedback would you have, right? For someone like me, right? White male running a company to creating or empowering, like, you know, what does that look like to support, um, you know, female leadership? So there's a couple of things. So number one, is a uh, it's awareness. That's where it always starts, right? So the, the the pure mentioning of you, of this fact that you're conscious about it, means that there's a a level of awareness. So you already know that there is something that's different. The second the second piece is to, you know, as the leader of your of your business, is to to do something that is very simple. Like, you know, I assume you have your vision statement. I assume you have your vision statement, your core values. Now I want you to add a set of leadership attributes that your organization is going to lead by with a caveat that they have to be half male and half female centric. So you can say we are a competitive company that is uh, driven by cutting edge technology, uh, wanting to be the industry leaders, who lead by empathy, with a, wanting to make a community impact in a collaborative environment. Now you have both. So you're balancing out the winning and the strategy with the female leadership aspects of being more community centric. So that's like one of the things I teach organizations is to say, where do we start? That's where you start with something this simple to say, what do we promote at DML Capital? How we lead. And if we look at this, is it balanced? Does it allow everyone to lead on their innate strength? Or are we forcing everyone into the same category so that we have the same, 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 the same kind of person coming out? And a lot of companies do that. From the hiring process to their organizational structures and systems, they force people to become more of the same person that can succeed in that structure. And it just doesn't work. 
Is it purely by, well, I know it's not, obviously the attributes piece, right? Um, and embodying the attributes that you're talking about uh, helps evolve the culture, right? Which is a lot of what you're speaking to. How do you determine what attributes, like how do you summarize, right? You talked about competitive and winning versus community, right? What is prototypically a male leadership attribute versus a female and, you know, achieving that balance? That's a conversation you have with the executive leadership team or with your, um, with your partners, where you sit down and you say, who do we want to be? And the, the urgency in this right now is that we are seeing this, that companies that are unwilling to change the way they run their business with the uh, people working from home, now that millennials and, you know, and not so much Gen Z yet, but, you know, up and coming, have tucked their children in at night, have had family meals, have seen their kids grow up, have actually spent time with their partners, their divorce rates are down, they are actually enjoying family life. They're not going back to the insanity our parents did because they see what it does. It makes people die at 65, two months after retirement. They don't want that. So the urgency is now to create an environment to say, we understand that what happened was a collective universal cry for, for balance. And now if we take this in our organizations, what does that look like here? Who do we want to be as leaders? Because your clients come to you, Liam, because they believe that their values align with your values. So if you want to add more clients and more of that next generation and the next generation, your values need to align with what they're looking for. And that is the balance. So you just literally, you just bring your team in and you say, we are looking at defining what leadership at DML Capital looks like. And what are these attributes we should lead by? And then you actually look at the attributes that people come up with and you say, if we were to give them a gender, what would they be? And some of them might already be neutral or balanced. You might not have an issue. You might already have innately done what you were talking about. How great is that? Then, then, you, then you just now have the consciousness to say, look at that. We already have done, we're already leading with the balance. Or you may say, well, it's a little heavy on the, on the hard charging side. What can we do to soften this up a little bit to attract more women or people who are not so driven by winning in competition? Do you think there's anything from your cultural background, right? Obviously you didn't grew up in Germany, uh, immigrant, single mother, right? A very unique perspective that you bring there, right? We're talking very much male, female, right? But uh, lots of different facets that bring different perspectives of a kind of community-based um, drive, right? Attributes, et cetera. How do you feel, you know, what role do those things play in and how do you evaluate those as you're trying to figure out this ideal cultural balance, vision, mission for your company? Um, you are absolutely correct. If you are a business owner who's left your city, your state, your country, maybe more than once met other people who look, sound, speak different, experience life differently. You know, and I come from the creative arts. And so in the creative arts, we have the most colorful, non-conforming characters known to man. And I always loved that because when you do photo production and all these crazy people come together, they're so talented, but they're all a little nuts. And then within a couple of days, you know, you come up with this amazing product and you think that people that are so diverse and so different and so unique can come together in such a comprised short amount of time and create something so powerful. If we would follow that principle of 
diversity in action, diversity of thought, behavioral diversity, how much better we would be. So I take that principle because that's just how I, how I was raised. You know, my father never, never once said, you are a girl, you can do something. My father thought all my ideas were great. My mother, not so much. <laughs> to this day, by the way. But um, I believe that when you are not afraid that somebody is going to take something away from you, but that others are enriching your experience, that's where everything changes. How did you get to the point where you made that mindset shift? Right, because it's not natural, right? I think our human nature uh, sets us up to protect what we have, right? To um, not be let down, right? And so uh, that's a big mindset shift, right? To, um, you know, whether it's be optimistic, you know, uh, see, see the good things, right? Be able to go and get, uh, see everything as growth, right? Versus protect. Like, how, what was that like for you? It's a, it, it, it was one of the moments in my life. I was, my father was a CEO for a dairy company and got fired. And I was photo editor at German L magazine at the time. I was 23 years old. I was running the department, photo department of L magazine in anybody's book, a pretty good job. I was making good money. And then my dad gets fired. And I realized in that moment that it is so easy to identify with what you do and people like you for what you can do for them because of the position you are in. But that does not mean they like you. That does not mean they even care about you. And it was in that moment where I realized I was an asshole and I needed to become a person that I liked. And that's when I quit and left Germany. As we're wrapping up time here, Beata, what, you know, what's the last you know, remaining thought that you'd like to leave listeners or one piece of advice for them? It probably would be to say that uh, don't take failure personal. Failure or nothing is nothing else but a road sign. Uh, with somebody standing there with a stop sign and just making sure that you know not to go down that road. So don't throw yourself on the ground and throw a temper tantrum, but thank that a stop sign for preventing you from going down further that road and just find another way. <laughs> don't make it hard on yourself, right? Yeah, uh, don't make it hard on yourself. It's like, what is that all about? What is the deal with failures? Cool. Um, what's the best way for our listeners to connect back and uh, be able to reach you? Yes. So you can go check me out on my website at beatechillette.com. And if you are a business owner and you want to un know on how I run the system, the five star success blueprint on how I uh, build and grow and scale businesses, go to airtightavatar.com. I give away one of the foundational pieces of growth architecture which is how to find really good clients, the foundation of how you sell, because you got to know who you're selling to. You find that at airtightavatar.com. And that is a free masterclass that I invite everybody to take. And if you have a question or you want to say hello, just reach out to find me on social media or just send me an email. Awesome. Appreciate your time today, Beata. I enjoyed the conversation and uh, look forward to staying connected. Thank you so much, Liam. It was a pleasure to be here.